Aloha Kako and welcome to Finding Our Futures. I'm John A. Sweeney at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. It's located right here. Uh, today's show, uh, we have a pretty exciting guest. Miriam Simon is an artist who does creative disruptions. Uh, a little bit of everything as we're going to hear about uh, provocateur in public spaces. Uh, she has lectured internationally uh, all over universities, uh, art installations, uh, been supported by national and international art foundations, uh, and is really doing some cutting edge work in the field of what we like to call either design fiction or sort of engaged foresight. So, uh, Miriam, thanks for uh, joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you. And then there's someone else with you, I understand. Uh, you brought. Uh... She's rubbing herself. She really likes technology. <laughs> okay. The chicken. Yeah, we were just saying, this is this, now the show is officially christened as being on the web because we have, uh, it's our first cat, so I'm glad that we were able to, to christen that with a, uh, yeah. So she's a technology cat. She loves all computers, warm uh, broadband providers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like a good cat should. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so not to make an awkward segue, but let's go right from uh, cats into dairy products. Uh, you sort of, uh, I don't want to say major name, but got a, a fair amount of you know, fame with the Human Cheese Project. So could you talk a little bit about what that was and how that came together? Sure. Um, so in 2010, I embarked uh, on a journey to make human cheese. Um, so cheese made from human milk. There was recently actually another project, very recently, uh, also called Human Cheese, which was um, by an artist collective, a European artist collective, um, where they made human cheese um, made with, I don't actually know what kind of milk, but I'm quite sure not human milk, but made with human bacteria. And so this was um, not that, this was cheese made from human milk. Um it was around a year long project that culminated in my opening something called the Lady Cheese Shop, which yes. was a small pop up shop on the Lower East Side um, that positioned itself as a cheese shop, although we didn't really sell anything. We only gave it away, but we gave away samples of three different kinds of human cheese. Mm. And so, how did you procure? the elements to make this cheese. I understand you uh, were seeking out this, I guess, base product online, right? You were basically getting breast milk on the internet. Definitely, yeah. Um, so that was kind of the very first challenge and the very first test to see if it was possible was, you know, where am I gonna get human milk? Cause it's, you think it's a, it's a pretty hard commodity to come by, but actually right. it turns out that's not at all the case or at least was not back then um, and I'm, I check every now and then. I think it's still available. There's a pretty interesting, pretty large gray market, um, mm. especially online, for human milk. And the reasons for that um, are also pretty interesting. I mean, when I started the project, the idea was really to... So I was thinking a lot about kind of emerging bioavailabilities right. um, and what we do with our bodies, what new technology enables us to do with our bodies, with other bodies, and how that comes into the market, and also how that comes into social norms. So if you think about, you know, like in vitro fertilization in the 70s was at first this really uh, intense, seemingly quite unnatural thing, but quite quickly became adopted as, um, as a fairly uh, accepted norm, at least in Western countries. Um, and so I was really interested in exploring why some things become accepted and some things mm. don't. Um, and I came up with this idea of cheese as, you know, cheese is a biotechnology, but it's really one of the very first biotechnologies we could say that humans came up with. And also, you know, it's an edible product, which kind of changes the game in an interesting right. way. But so the idea behind the project was really not just to make human cheese and say, hey, look, um, but to explore what it means uh, as like a viable product, as a viable commodity. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was to really create a, a system that could potentially um, be functioning that, you know, sourced, made, distributed human cheese. Um, so the first challenge was, okay, where do we get human milk? And I just went online, went on Craigslist, where I go to get everything, <laughs> and said, okay, like, let's try. Why not? So I 
Google, I looked it up on Craigslist, and lo and behold, I got actually really lucky because Craigslist is not the biggest um, distribution system for human milk. But I actually found someone that I had posted a listing um, not far from me that was selling their milk at two dollars an ounce. And once I did that, I said, "Okay, this this can happen." Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, I found out, so there's a bunch of different websites. There's some where that allow women to sell their milk online. Um, there's some kind of now that have come up this kind of milk trading website where women share milk with each other, um, not for financial gain. Um, and the kind of there's a lot of ideology behind that, but it's this idea that... Um, if they're not doing it for financial gain, that there's more trust, perhaps, that, that mm. the product is quality. Because, of course, there are a lot of really, you know, health issues, um, obviously ethical issues that come up with that. Um, but within the kind of gray market that is human milk trading online, because it's illegal to trade organs. And so they, that's why they call it this kind of gray market, because it, it's not an organ, but it's obviously a bodily fluid and one that also can contain viruses. Mm. Um so, uh, within this gray market, there's also kind of a lot of really interesting differentiation that I found happening. I mean, there's women that are buying it for their children if because for whatever reason they can't or they choose not to breastfeed. Um, there are, you know, same-sex and non-same-sex just uh, parents that have adopted that can't produce milk that want to feed um, human milk to their children. There's a section on every one of these websites called willing to sell to men so there's some kind of whether sexual or emotional or kind of fantasy driven uh market um and there are also a series of people kind of bodybuilders cancer patients all kinds of people looking at really interesting that believe that it has certain effects for their body and certain health effects and the interesting thing about it is there's very very little which is not unfortunately not very uncommon um, with women-related health issues, but there's very little research really into what are the properties of human milk, what are the effects on adults. There's like almost no research into this. Mm. Um, So they're as of yet unfounded and could potentially um, be actually true, these kind of beliefs in the health of human milk. Mm. Yeah, it's really fascinating to hear about this whole, like you're saying, an entire gray market that... I mean, clearly is 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 out there, but that is sort of under the radar. So when you were sort of getting into this, did you find yourself like it, it was like an onion, like one layer after another, and it was just like seemed infinitely recessive that you were you were into this entire world, right? So so you sort of had the idea to go in with cheese and to develop a supply chain, but how did you see yourself broaching these obviously very delicate? Ethico, social, ethico, political, uh, you know, bio sort of issues, and and then think about what kind of norms you would want to, I think, explicitly articulate, but then also implicitly kind of poke at uh, with this project. So it's a really good question, and I think the layers analogy is really um, apt. Um, the way I kind of term my art practice is to say I make creative disruptions, um, which is a whole you know, idea that I'm playing with in and of itself. It's kind of a play on this uh, notion of creative destruction, which is a quite familiar concept from capitalism that says, that kind of describes the way innovation happens, that um, in order for capitalism to function, in order for innovation to happen, we have to destroy, like incessantly revolutionize system from within, destroy them from within to allow new ones to emerge. Um, And I think that, I mean, the, you know, Marx pretty much described that this is one of the essential functions of capitalism and actually how capitalism will destroy itself, which I think is an interesting concept. But what I say is, you know, I make creative disruptions. And so I am very interested in innovation and change, um, not necessarily in destruction and not necessarily in the belief that that's always the way forward to just uh, destroy everything that exists and kind of plow forward to the bright future ahead, but rather to disrupt and to like shake up and then to see, to really interrogate and understand where things land. Um, But all that is to say is that I make them and that's a really important part of the work. So it's one thing to say human cheese, it's an interesting idea, let's make a, you know, a cheese container and leave it at that. And it's another thing to, you know, go through with the process and all of these 
really delicate and complicated um, issues around ethics, but also around understanding this very interesting market of grave market around human milk and also the history behind why that market emerged, which has to do with a whole other kind of historical and political um, situation around human milk banks that are associated with hospitals, at least in the U.S. Um, I'm not so familiar with the history in other countries. But um, all of these things, I feel like, um, are best dealt with and are can be understood in, 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 in the depth that's required really through going through this process. Um, you know, I, so I made cheese. I had never made cheese before. And I learned how to make cheese. And I was making, I was meeting these women. I was spending a lot of time with some of them, um, discussing ethical issues, helping them sometimes with their children, um, just living with them, being with them, and then going home and taking their milk and making cheese out of it and smelling that and touching that. And all of these um, kind of very visceral engagements uh, complicate any ideas you have off right. the top of your head of like what are the ethics and mm -hmm. what is the you know what are the norms around this in such an infinite amount of really interesting and important ways that um that yeah that i think the peeling the layers of the onion back is, is a really apt metaphor for how that happens so going into it, I mean, clearly you must have had some goals or, or some sense as to what you wanted to you know, accomplish. Do you feel like the project turned out like you expected? The, the response was there? Or do you feel like it, it blew away your expectations? I mean, clearly what you've just said, like you, there, were, there was an intimacy to this, to this process, right? That you were sort of going through this and working through this and, and not just, you know, dealing with these issues in a, in a, you know, at arm length, but clearly grappling with them in the relationships you were building, right? In the actual going through the process. So how did, how did that as an artist? And, and I, I'm also wondering too, would you consider yourself a futurist with the work that you're doing? Uh, and that, that term obviously has lots of connotations, but um, thinking about your imagining change and imagining technologies and imagining norms and disrupting them, it's a lot of what we talk about and do uh, in the futurist field. And so I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well. Sure. Um, do I consider myself a futurist? No. <laughs> I think is the answer to that question. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in future futurism, and I've um, engaged in my own way a lot with the with the methodology and with the thinking of that, and I find it really um, powerful mode to embody. Um, but I don't consider myself a futurist. I mean, I'm an artist and I'm really interested in change and I'm interested in how we think about change. And, um, I think I'm actually, I continue to make these very, uh, design fiction type, you know, work that can be understood as design fiction, but that's not the only work that I've made. And, and I've actually recently started thinking about, um, you know, change on a more uh, immediate, I don't know, the project that I'm working on now is looking at food and gentrification and kind of how um, gentrification is both, ex or at least here in Brooklyn, is both expressed uh, and furthered through, very much through food establishments. Mm. Um, so that's just one example. But I find futurism really powerful um, more powerful in engaging people in thinking about um, the implications of certain proposals and a much more powerful one really than art. Um, so in a way, I, I use that tool um, to convey the message that maybe I'm looking to express with my art. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that we we've sort of taken on in some of the the lineage of what we call the Manoa School of Futures uh, doesn't draw that sharp line, right? So it was an unfair question because we see ourselves as engaging, obviously, in the present and trying to disrupt and challenge and promote that kind of thought. So I think that I mean, obviously, many of us wish we had a more <laughs> a more you know detailed or a better artistic eye, but I think that. Uh, that's that's the idea is to is to really engage people at that intimate level and to to challenge them to think in ways that might not you know otherwise and, and even beyond thinking get them to feel right to actually have someone feel the future or to feel uncertainty and to sort of internalize that I think is is what art can do 
uh, and what more art should do. So yeah, it's exciting to hear. Uh, okay, so uh, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, we are talking to Miriam Simon, uh, world-renowned artist, famous, uh, I'm gonna say artist again, but put futurists and asterisks there, because uh, obviously we would love to claim your work. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then sort of a provocateur of creative disruptions and the originator of the, can we call it a movement now, a human cheese movement? I guess since it's, sort of happening elsewhere or okay all right we can say that uh yeah. so you're watching finding our futures i'm john a sweeney at hrcfs uh stick with us we'll be back in a flash aloha i'm nicole hori for think tech for nearly half a century the hawaii foreign trade zone number nine has brought the benefits of the foreign trade zone program to hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs dbet the department of business economic development and tourism operates hawaii's foreign trade zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. One, two, three, Aloha Kako. Welcome back to Finding Our Futures. I'm John A. Sweeney at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. Uh, if you're tuning in today, you are hearing really cool stuff from Miriam Simon, uh, who is an artist. Uh, again, we're trying to claim her as a futurist. Uh, does creative disruptions, uh, provocateur of uncertainty and change. Uh, world-renowned, sponsored, amazing stuff. So uh, when we left off last time, we're obviously talking about the very intimate, visceral experience you had with the Human Cheese Project, creating, like you said, not just an engaged experience, but having to go through and look at the pipeline and think about supply chain, and then obviously engaged in this, this huge world. And so you mentioned also that you're doing now work with uh, gentrification and looking at food. And I also want to hear a little bit about the Ghost Food Project as well. So. Yeah, just maybe give us a rundown of things that you have or projects you're sort of working on, and then obviously we can we can spend a bit of time talking about ghost food too. Sure. Um, so before maybe I get into the rundown of projects, I guess in response to your question of future uh, and thinking about now, you can see that I'm working on, for example, three projects on food. So why food? I'm actually, um, you know, it's not that I really love to cook or anything like that. Uh, but you know, thinking about kind of the methods of futurism and design fiction and using, kind of materializing all of these quite complicated, lofty, faraway, abstract concepts that futurism does deal with into this very material, experiential um, thing that someone can feel then, um, that is kind of how I arrived at food. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's such a powerful medium and you know the human cheese project was the first time I actually ever worked with food and it was quite a complicated food to start with but um it's it's really interesting because um everybody kind of feels uh like they have a right to food in a way that not everybody mm -hmm. feels like they have a right to art everybody is an expert you know we all eat every day and we know what we like and we know what we don't like and I don't right. feel like um, although there's certain a lot of kind of snobbery and uh, cuisine politics, especially here in New York, um, I don't think it's as, is it as expressed as much. Um, and also just by the nature of it, I mean, you're putting it in your body. Um, so there's like a level of trust and a level of visceral engagement and a level of comfort with it that I find it a super powerful medium to work with. And at the same time, embodies technology, embodies social conventions, embodies ideology, embodies history, embodies all of these very human, like it's, you know, it's one of the um, primary material cultures that anthropologists study. Um, so that's kind of how I arrived at food, and, and in that way maybe that connects more to this um, futurist uh, thinking. Um, but, so the project I'm working on now is, is called Eating Down Franklin. Uh, Franklin Avenue is a street here in Brooklyn that um, has just uh, is is very much undergoing the process of gentrification, and it's happening at a really insane pace. I mean, New York um, changes over really quickly as it is, but I think um, it's really happening here now and happening, uh, you know, maybe four or five times faster than we saw the rest of Brooklyn, just because of the way developers saw how quickly uh, it is possible to change. Um, the market situation um and in particular also just like some local politics and the way uh 
prices happened and the way certain zoning laws happened, Franklin is rife for change. Um, so it's a project that it's a it's a very simple project, but it's pretty much one person um, with a steady a video piece with a steady shot eating at every single uh, food establishment on Franklin Avenue one by one in order, and so. You know, it's quite a simple act of them eating, but as you see the food that they eat and kind of the colors and the sounds in the background, you can see how quickly um, block to block or even not within block, you have um, kind of traditional Hasidic communities, uh, traditionally African-American communities, pockets that have become gentrified and kind of the, the style, the colors, the culture, the food... Um, that comes with it and how it's expressed and kind of also pushed by that. So that's a project I'm working on now. And then Ghost Food is a project that I've just uh, wrapped up for now um, because here it's now cold and so we're taking a little hiatus until spring. But Ghost Food is a food truck that serves taste experiences of foods that are threatened with extinction because of climate change. And so the way these um, taste experiences are consumed is through a wearable device that I'm sorry actually I'm realizing I don't have it here with me now otherwise I would put it on for you um but it's a device that you wear and it um uses the fact that so much of our experience of flavor is actually an olfactory sensation um so it uses scent to kind of trick the brain into experiencing a flavor that is not necessarily eating not necessarily mm. consuming um but nevertheless you kind of feel like what you're eating tastes like that. Mm. So the three foods that we serve are cod from the ocean, chocolate from the rainforest, and peanuts from the grassland. And all of those three species have particular challenges that they're facing in their particular climate as the climate changes globally. Um, so this was a food truck that traveled in October um, around New York, Philadelphia, and New Jersey. And we parked in the street um, and served people taste experiences with our army of ghost food staff. <laughs> Very cool. And how was the response to ghost food? Did people connect the dots? I mean, were you, obviously, the point is to challenge people to think about these issues and to sort of you know, embrace the experience. So what, what were some of the responses to the, the ghost food tastings? Sure. Um, so we really had a quite varied response. And it was interesting because we played a lot with context. I mean, sometimes we were presented in a more art context where it was more clear to people that we this was a performance. But our staff were never trained, were trained to always, um, you know, when asked what it was to say it's a food truck, we're a ghost right. food. We are founded in 2013. Um but the staff are really there to kind of guide people and help them reflect on their experience and also help them um, understand, you know, if they're curious why it is that that they have to eat chocolate milk with just regular milk and the scent of chocolate. What's mm. happening with chocolate? That was a very big concern that we encountered. <laughs> um, so they were there to kind of inform them about the particularities of, of drought and how that species is responding. Right. Um, but response is really varied, and I think that's really the interesting thing about making these experiential future um, experiences is that some people said, tastes great, like it's fine, glad that I'll still be able to experience chocolate even if it's no longer here, while other people um, kind of, it affected them quite personally. I mean, the foods that were chosen were particularly chosen because they are something that I think most Americans, especially in the East Coast, have um, an experience with. I mean, chocolate and peanut butter, I think, are pretty national. And then cod, I grew up in Boston, so cod is a very kind of fish and chips, uh, traditional food. Um, and so there's an interesting thing, again, right, that happens. So climate change or global warming is this huge... Um, massive concept, huge problem, uh, massive challenge to wrap your head around. And it means so many different things in different contexts. And, you know, you always hear, or I, I was always struck how I would hear some people say, oh, it's going to get warm, it's going to get warmer, it's going to get colder, it's going to rain more, it's going to rain less. And, and it's quite this, this massive change. And so the, the idea behind the, the ghost food was really 
to take climate change, which is this really big thing, and to specify it into something very specific and something that people have a personal relationship to. So even if you can't deal or don't care or even don't believe in global warming, um, peanut butter is like a lot easier a lot easier to, to deal with and it and it's something you know that you're experiencing the taste, the smell. Um, and then so through peanut butter we lead you to the peanut plant. Mm. Um, and then from the peanut you know, from the peanut plant we get to the grasslands climate. And then maybe from the grasslands climate and you understand that droughts are increasing in this particular climate and um, interestingly enough, this actually isn't making peanuts extinct in and of itself, but it makes them develop aflatoxin, which is a fungus that makes them um, toxic to human consumption. Hmm. Which begs an interesting question of what happens to the peanut plant if they become inedible to humans, right? Hmm. And kind of leads to this um, very, for me, nice interwoven history of humans and other species and climate change and how it's it's not just as simple as the ice is melting, the polar bears are drowning, that's it. But actually, each of the, every species has a very, you know, complex climate, human history, particular eco ecological um, story to them that are kind of unique and fascinating in and of itself. Um, but kind of in this way, it was this very specific and quite fun um, way to access this larger issue of climate change. A lot of people felt sad, um, which it was the first time that I've done a work where where people said, well, I feel really sad now. Oh. <laughs> and at first I wasn't really sure what to do, but, uh, or not what to do, but I, I, it was just a little bit somehow surprising to me. Um, but perhaps it's uh, necessary. I guess maybe they are articulating something that is, um, I've, you know, I'm always, I'm constantly sad about this. And this was kind of a funny way to, to play with it, to work with it for me. And so I, I guess I was surprised. Um, like, have you not been sad until now? Or <laughs> are you surprised that this is what, what this right. particular situation right. has been sad. Yeah. But then again, you see, again, in response to the futurist question, um, with a lot of people, it was, especially older people that have children, they say, oh, well, but I can't imagine a world where my grandchildren don't eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or don't know what the taste of chocolate is. Um, and so it's these personal hooks into these larger systems that, that become really powerful. Yeah, it's really interesting to see it provoke almost that nostalgia in people, right? But it's it's this reverse nostalgia where they're they're longing for these experiences, but for future generations and and it's really striking how you're able to stage that intimacy and have people then work through the the, food, the sort of supply chain, right? And to, you know, like you said, boil down what is a very big, you know, abstract concept, I guess, for a lot of people and certainly for the deniers camp, right? <laughs> sort of, and but to literally ingest what that means or, or to inhale, I, I suppose, in this instance, right? To, to really intake that and to process it. Um, we've, we've uh, obviously on a much smaller scale had experiences where we stage uh, an engaged sort of, you know, foresight future scenario. And we've had people walk out of the room and it always tends to be when, when we bring up children or sort of future generations, that seems to be a really intimate point of contact that obviously provokes a lot of emotion, uh, which obviously with, with your work is the point, right? You want people to feel this, you want people to, to really embrace that experience. Um, so you said you're going to start, start this up again when it gets a bit warmer outside, you'll take the show on the road some more. Yes, we're, I'm working on that now. It looks like we might be in New Mexico, but nothing is yet um, planned. My hopes are to do a kind of a national, well, continental tour. Um, so let's see if that uh, materializes. Cool. Very cool. Well, again, if there's any way to get you out to Hawaii, obviously, that would be that would be great. I mean, I, I say that, but with cod in the East Coast, there are conversations about the ahi or the tuna population here, which is a very big staple and yet obviously there are huge issues with you know overfishing and so people are basically having the same conversation and that's what's really fascinating about even though your, your project was intentionally very provincial uh you could take that and it has ramifications right in a variety of contexts and so it really opens up to a, a broader conversation uh, to try to get people to think about that sort of stuff 
Uh, cool, very cool. All right, so we're going to take another break. Uh, we will be back in just a bit. We're hearing from Miriam Simon, uh, who is an artist, does creative disruption. She's talking about her new project on Franklin Avenue, where I think you can still get pretty good jerk chicken, right? It's been a while since I've been there, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and also the Ghost Food Project. Uh, so this is Finding Our Futures. I'm Johnny Sweeney at HRCFS. Stick with us. We'll be back in a flash. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha. I'm Maria Kashem of Think Tech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our Think Tech talk shows. If you didn't know it, Think Tech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon, and we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on ThinkTech. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. We have some news for you. In addition to our ThinkTech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechaway.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Here, come on this. Aloha kako and welcome back to Finding Our Futures. I'm Johnny Sweeney at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. Uh, if you've been tuning in, you've been hearing some really cool stuff from Miriam Simon, who's an artist who focuses on pro sort of food engagements, creative disruptions. Uh, her work with human cheese is world renowned. And then she was recently telling us about the gentrification project and then her work with ghost food, which was a an engaged food truck experience to have people think critically and then also feel and sort of go through uh, these the ramifications of climate change and how it's going to impact food systems and then to deal with obviously the, the, the sort of bridge to tomorrow and thinking about this uncertainty. Uh, so as we were sort of chatting, we we're sort of going through the thread and this what we've been talking about is this question of, of futures and engagement. And you're saying in some ways that you sort of happened upon food because it was a very intimate way of, of sort of bringing people to think about that. And obviously as an artist, uh, you're concerned about the full experience, right? Not just what people see, but the sort of totality of it. So how do you see your sort of practice developing or emerging uh, in sort of future context where, where now, I would say, at least from our experience, um, people are hyper-stimulated, right? I mean, we live in a social sphere in a context where it's, you know, if, they're, if you're not checking in on Foursquare or tweeting what you're doing instantaneously, you know, like, so there's that deprivation. So do you, do you find that your work attempts to engage uh, with, with that aspect? Or do you find that people are, are willing to sort of set that aspect aside? How do, you, have you, how do you see that fitting into your practice, the sort of uh, ubiquity of technology, other than obviously how you've integrated uh, new technologies into your work? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, as with almost every innovation and uh, element of progress, there are good and bad things, um, and things I fight against and things I embrace and help me a lot. Um, so, when I was training the Ghost Food staff um, in how to engage the audience, the number one thing I would tell them is, you know, 80% of the people that you encounter are going to want to put this weird thing on their head, take an Instagram, and walk away. <laughs> and your job is to get them to be on, like, one step beyond that. Mm. Um, how, like, how do we just get people to stop for a second and reflect right. on what's right. happening? Which I think in and of itself is, I mean, and there are a lot of people that write about this and say it better than I will, but that this maybe um, documentation has taken over the the part where you actually reflect instead of document. Right. Um, so in the actual experience, I I really work hard to to move beyond that because because everything I'm 
working with um, is dealing with complexity um, in a way. And at the same time, the, the thing that I said that I work with it is, um, you know, in order for the experience to be powerful, someone has to have it. And for them to have it, they have to hear about the work. And so in that way, I can't say that social media and kind of new technology hasn't helped spread the word about um, many of my different projects. And in that way, um, it's really important to, pa to be able to package things in a really kind of short um, hook, right? So whether it's human cheese or whether it's, you know, ghost food of extinct foods that are ex going extinct due to climate change. Um, there are kind of these sound bites and these ways that we can engage and bring in huge amounts of people. And only when you get there, do I have my um, staff working really hard to get you to reflect, to get us like to start to unpack. What does it mean extinct food? Well, mm. it's not extinct. Maybe that it just becomes inedible to humans or maybe that it's not extinct. Maybe it's just that, um, you know, it's no longer going to be able to be grown in the place where for generations and generations people have been growing it. So what happens when, you know, all the apple trees, or I mean, apple is not a great example, but all the fruit trees move like two countries north are all, you know, all the farmers are going to be able to move with them. Mm. Um, and so you can start to unpack these complexities. And I think, I mean, yeah, that's really what I'm, what I'm after because I think in all of the, I mean, we are, currently as a society obsessed with innovation um i recently <laughs> had dinner with someone that said he gave a presentation about the future of in innovation and i just i started laughing so hard because <laughs> the future of the future of the future uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and i think um due to a number of different forces one of them being social media another one being um the speed of which capital is moving and like ever faster in an increasingly alarming rate. Um, uh, we want to move so quickly that we want to understand what something is uh, really easily and with a really short bite. But with that, you lose the depth and the complexity <clears throat> of things. Um, and that's, I guess, really what I'm kind of working against in a way is to always unpack like human cheese, good, bad, no, like we unpack the very many layers that is this proposal and start to explore and start to understand that um, that the complexities are such that like it it's enables um, you know that it's really important to consider these different things and kind of understand where you where you in particular land and I think that's what I'm working towards. Right, right, yeah. That's really interesting. How again, like it, it really comes down to the individual, but obviously people open it up to the generational and even think about the extended sort of familial context. And I'm so I'm wondering, do, is there is there an angle in your work where you feel that people take away a sense of, of empowerment, or is it is it reflective? Like, so if they walk away from a from the ghost food experience, how do you feel that they they are able to? Oh, pardon the pun, to digest that and then to sort of, uh, you know, move it through and feel like they're able to, again, uh, productively walk away. Or is it really to sort of, like you said, to sort of layer that complexity on them to have them sort of try to process it? Um, and, and, and do you see that as being uh, the, the necessary component or is that something you maybe want to play with in future contexts? In I'm sorry, empowerment? Is that well, yeah, I'm just thinking empowerment in the sense of, so, you know, these, these foods are going extinct, right? And so your children might not have these and you have this experience, but what can they do about it? And obviously for many of us, the answer is not much, right? So we, we, we feel, and then this is a large part of the larger narrative of climate change, how disempowered we are as individuals, right? And how communities do things and so on and so forth. So I'm wondering where you see your art and your, your practice fitting into uh, the sense of people their engagement with the issue, right? Uh, if 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 they if you think that they walk away, like you said, some people felt sad, but did they feel empowered to try to change, or or what what would be that the point at which they feel like maybe they could be an agent of change uh, given this like uncertainty? So this is where I'm not a futurist, I'm <laughs> a because my job is to ask questions, and mm. that's really where I. I draw the line quite um, firmly because in every experience that I have, and again, like in the way I train my staff is never to be didactic mm. and never to really have a 
strong point of view. I mean, right. we are never advocating for a point of view. We are advocating only to consider something in a way they haven't before, to ask themselves. If I, you know, if I can get somebody to ask themselves a question that they haven't before, or to like reconsider um, an accepted idea that they thought was like they had figured out and just put away, then then it's incredibly <clears throat> successful. Mm. Um, and then I pass it over to the futurists, to the advocates, to the policymakers, or um, to the community organizers, and hopefully that's where um, some kind of you know like awareness, empowerment, action can start to happen. But my job, I feel like, is much more to just um, kind of unsettle the dust. Right. Right. Um, and then only, and I think that that, I mean, kind of. To my defense of, uh, you know, you're just a troublemaker is I think that that's really important that um, it's only out of a little bit of discomfort and out of shaking up your preconceived notions that you can even get to a place where you start to to want to push for something else or. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, actually, I mean, I was asking in part because I'm not sure that we do a very good job <laughs> of getting people to sort of walk away. I mean, we obviously focus a lot of our work is exploring alternatives and uncertainty and helping people to think about preferred outcomes. But that's very different from saying, OK, at the end of this, you know, here's how you can initiate or enact the kind of change you want to see. I mean, that's always the struggle that we do. And, and actually, in many ways, I've seen you know, what the, the work that you've done. Uh, I actually had a chance to meet, I always butcher her last name, uh, Natalie Jeremajenko. Uh, if you're familiar with her work, right, and the work that she's done, I, I find is really engaging and actually is empowering to people precisely because of what you said, because it is it is at a, such a visceral, you know, affective level that it really challenges people to to rethink their lives and, and their place in this sort of, you know, grand space. So, uh, yeah, actually, I, <laughs> again, I was hoping to hear the answer because I'm not sure we actually have the answer as well, even though obviously we have lots of questions. Um, okay, so... Uh, yeah, I'll say this for empowerment. Um, and I saw this particularly with the Human Cheese Project. To take, a, to take somebody... Um, through an experience where they come in knowing that the world is like this and coming out the other side, not even thinking that the world is different, but just saying maybe the world is not like this, maybe it can be like this also, I think can be really frightening, but can also be really empowering in that we, like we are making what exists and right. what exists only right. exists because we agree to it and we make it and we believe in it. So I hope in that way it can be empowering, right? That all of these things that you um, understood as stable are there for you to play with, really. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think like exactly what you're saying. Like art can be empowering in the sense it is open and opening up, right? And it's up to them how they how they do that. Uh, okay, so we're gonna take our last break. Uh, we'll be back in just a bit with Miriam Simon. We're hearing about Ghost Food, all of the cool projects she has going on. So this is Finding Our Futures. I'm John A. Sweeney at HRCFS. Stick with us. We'll be back in a flash. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Aloha Kako. Welcome back to Finding Our Futures. I'm Johnny Sweeney at HRCFS. Uh, we are hearing from Miriam Simon, world-renowned artist, provocateur, maker of human cheese, uh, the genius mind behind ghost food. So uh, when we left off, we were talking a little bit about sort of how art can be empowering. And I wanted to just sort of segue into thinking about the kinds of audiences that you've had. Uh, I imagine in dealing with different sort of art communities and then even dealing with uh, sort of like the food truck experience um, that I don't want to say class or, or gender distinction, but like, did you find that there were a certain group of people that were repetitive coming to these things? Did you feel like you had a really interesting cross-section? Who was sort of engaged in these, these different projects? 
So context is everything. I mean, with Ghost Food, we were really lucky. Um, our presenting gallery was a gallery of Faro, and they're based in Newark, New Jersey, which is a um, kind of quite a poor, uh, very working class neighborhood in New Jersey. Um, and then we were in Chelsea, which is a you know very wealthy, uh, very kind of New York art, the center of the New York art gallery scene. Um, we were in Philadelphia. So context is everything, and we encountered different people based on where we were. Um, and I think that just has to do with the fact of a little bit what I was talking about with food. I think with art, um, there definitely is a lot of class uh, issues and just a lot of cultural kind of mm. knowledge issues. Um, but with food, everybody feels they have a right to it, and everybody feels like an expert. And I think that that's a really important thing um, that I use in order to engage all kinds of different people. And I, and I, you know, I really try to, because frankly, it's so much more interesting to have a wide range of people and to not only ever work with, um, you know, with the very particular art crowd. Right. <clears throat> right. I'm working on a project now, actually, um, that's a new kind of challenge, um, that, uh, I'm not going to, you know, it's it's still in its very early stages, but basically it's kind of a social experiment to uh, encourage intergenerational living, hmm. um, particularly in kind of declining suburban American communities in the Midwest. Hmm. Um, so I've just started working, um, and they're kind of in a way, this is like a more social practice piece, so it's very much working with people, and that, that is the art project. Um, but so I've just started working with kind of... Um, rural and suburban uh that you know midwestern americans in their 70s and 80s um which has proven incredible and then thinking about what happens when you pair those people with young urban creative um types very cool yeah and that obviously has been a huge issue as a variety of urban centers i mean obviously detroit comes to mind right you have this sort of massive gutting out obviously rent drops young artists creatives can move in and, and obviously it shifts so uh, you mentioned a lot of the gentrification happening in Brooklyn. Um, so do you see yourself exploring this in the context of, like you, like you were talking about last time, the sort of hyper flows of capital? Or do you see this as being uh, maybe more like the human cheese project and sort of like linking with those little lines of the of the more intimate connections and then opening up to those bigger questions? I start small. I start like with this very particular thing, like cheese from human milk or flavor is, you know, our experience of flavor is scent. So why not use scent like in this very visually externalized way? Um, this project I'm working on is, you know, you have older people that need help and need companionship and have really big houses and you have younger people that have energy and um, have no money to live and right. no space to live. So why not pair them? <clears throat> um, and in doing so kind of, reestablish intergenerational communication that's so important to society that we seem to be losing, mm. um, at least in particular communities. Uh, so it very much starts with just a kernel of an idea. Um, and then through that, you know, it links to all these larger issues. And like I said, it's through actually doing the work that the complexity and the interestingness of these issues really comes out for me at mm. least. Um, we can talk about, like, you know, I can read as many papers as I want about aging in place, but it's actually, you know, bring some crazy 20-year-old uh, sculptor into an 85-year-old suburban home and, and helping them establish how to negotiate living together and how to establish trust and uh, agree to a system of exchange that all of these issues come out in their lived experience and kind of can be understood in their full um, depth of human experience really mm. and so the project this project specifically you have people that have sort of signed up or you're selecting people how are you getting the participants to to agree to this um the chicken is like exploring the light in a <laughs> um so i'm just the beginning process of just starting to do research around the project and just starting to have conversation different levels of conversations and activities with the two groups I'm working with, which is kind of the elderly and the young, um, poor artists. Um, 
but yeah, eventually it's, it, I'm working to establish like a residency program that is kind of more official and more trustworthy. Um, uh, and to begin to pair people based on, and we're, like, I, that's something we're, we're all figuring out together now is how, how exactly do you pair people and how do you set up um, a system of asset exchange that doesn't include financial exchange um, that are early stages. Hmm. Well, sounds very interesting. Uh, I'll be excited to keep up with it. So obviously we can keep track of everything through your website, uh, miriamsimon.com, also on Twitter, at MiroSim. Did I get that one right? I think I did. Okay, awesome. So Miriam, uh, thanks so much for chatting today. Really appreciate hearing about all your work. Really exciting stuff. Definitely hope to stay in the loop. Uh, is Chicken there? I'll say aloha to Chicken. Yeah, off on the side. There's Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Aloha, chicken. <laughs> okay, and thanks again for chatting. I uh, really appreciate it. So this is Finding Our Futures. I'm Johnny Sweeney, HRCFS. Today you heard from Miriam Simon, world-renowned artist, provocateur, maker of human cheese, the genius behind ghost food, uh, up to some really good stuff. So uh, check us out next week, and uh, yeah, see you later. Aloha.